Good morning. Good morning. My name is Stephen. I'm a communicator in the education department here at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. And it is my privilege this morning to introduce to you astronaut Charlie Walker. Charlie was born in Bedford, Indiana. He has degrees in both aeronautical and astronautical air and engineering from Purdue University. He assisted in the development of the Space Shuttle's map propulsion systems. And he also assisted in the development of a pharmaceutical manufacturing experiment that later flew on the shuttle. He trained four different crews to operate that experiment. And then he operated himself three times on the space shuttle. And later he assisted in the design and development of that International Space Station that you just saw up here. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce to you astronaut Charlie Walker. Spaceport USA. Here we are in nice Florida today, uh, out there, uh, which means you're going to want to get in the air conditioning as often as possible today. And be sure to listen to those messages out there because uh, sometimes there is lightning kind of close, uh, and you'll want to listen to when they tell you to kind of hit for cover and stay out of exposed places. But uh, this will be a wonderful day. Uh, this is a unique place, so I'm going to lend a little more uh, insight for you to kind of some of the things you saw there in that video. Specifically, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my uh, history here. Uh, for a few years as a part of the space shuttle program, uh, and uh, then we're going to gaze uh, into the crystal ball of the future just a little bit. As cloudy as that is, but I'm very optimistic about that future, so uh, stand by for that. Then we get to the best part of the program, Q&A. Your questions, my answers. So if you promise to think up the best questions you can, okay, I promise to make up the best answers I can. Okay. <laughs> All right, I was, I was there, as Steve said in the introduction, not as an NASA career astronaut, but as a commercial astronaut, the first paying working customer in space. Uh, my corporation paid to have me there to do research uh, in better ways to create pharmaceuticals and medical materials for all of us here on Earth. How, how will space ups do that, you might ask? Well, I will answer by saying, here on Earth, all the processes that we use to purify medical and pharmaceutical materials, and they have to be pure for ingestion by the human. All the processes we use are disturbed by gravity. That means that there are still impurities in the best of the pharmaceuticals and the medical research material that we use. Without gravity, without gravity, which causes those disturbances here on Earth, without gravity, they should become 100% pure when we process them, purify them. That's what this equipment that's here with me in this photograph, and that's what our intention was, and the end of that story is, it works. We have technology, we have techniques proven uh, here and in space shuttle flights that we can produce better, pure pharmaceuticals, actually and even produce it much more rapidly than is possible here in the gravity field of the Earth. But we can't get to space. We can't get to space in a fashion that's regular, that's reliable, and that's inexpensive enough to allow this business plan to work, to allow us to improve our, uh, our health care. Yet, but that future is coming as well. I'm sure there will be future transportation systems that have all those good characteristics, and this technology will be a part of that, as well as many other things which we're discovering even as we speak aboard the space station. And we'll talk about all of that in just a second. But now, back to the big picture. My involvement. I was, uh, as I said, uh, a research uh, commercial astronaut, a payload specialist in the queue, the lineup of space shuttle crew member positions. And I flew with five different NASA astronauts on each one of my three flights. But in addition, all of us were uh, fortunate enough to fly with, uh, for his one and only flight, Senator Jake Garn from the great state of Utah. And on my third flight, we were all, uh, we all had great, the great pleasure to fly with Mexico's first astronaut. Uh, mi amigo, Dr. Rodolfo Neri Vega. Training, absolutely important. This is rocket science. This is risky business. And so you want to be as trained up as is possible when you go sit on that rocket and they like the fuse. So there is at least a year's worth of basic training, and then there's even more intense training focused on the specifics of your mission before you actually get to sit in the rocket on the launch pad. 
That training involves a few things like I have images representing here. For instance, uh, maybe a third of Nationals' time in training is spent uh, with emergency systems training, emergency equipment familiarization. You spend a lot of time in training, of course, working with the procedures, the equipment, the things you're going to do up there to get the, the procedures, the uh, uh, effective results in mind, and you're all queued up and practiced and ready to go. We spend a lot of time also training with what might go wrong with what we're going to work with up there. You also you want to be ready to repair, fix, work around the things you're doing if they don't work out the way you expect. Uh, there's no geek squad, there's no repair shop next door up there. You've got to do that yourself. So training to fix problems and knowing how you might fix problems before you go is a uh, very efficient way to go about this business. And then I had a chance, while I'm not a pilot, NASA didn't make me a pilot, I had a chance and the opportunity, in fact, NASA wanted all its uh, payload specialists, mission specialists, to fly with uh, pilots, with uh, astronaut pilots, in uh, the second seat of a T-38 jet trainer aircraft. NASA has a few of those for their astronauts training use. In fact, there's one of them, if you haven't seen those before, there's one here on the property. Go out and take a look at it. I had a chance to fly some hours in the back seat uh, of T-38s. Great training experience. Jet flight, high-speed jet flight, uh, especially the aerobatics and the G maneuvers, high G maneuvers are the closest thing to uh, rocket flight that we can uh, train with that we can get to here on Earth. But maybe the third closest thing is like the shuttle launch experience. So be sure to do that today right here on this uh, problem. This was my first ride to space. Discovery, the good ship Discovery. This was the way Discovery looked on the launch pad stacked with its launch components in preparation for its first flight, which happened to be my first flight as well. Part of the first crew of Discovery. Now, the vehicle, uh, the Orbiter Discovery, is a space truck and a space taxi. And uh, inside that cargo compartment for that first flight were three paying customers, three communication satellites, but there was also a NASA technical experiment. And we were all going to go to space attached to a big orange tank. That uh, enormous tank uh, held a super cold liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, which fueled uh, the engines at the base end of the uh, orbiter. Those fired from starting a few seconds before liftoff to make sure they're working well all the way through the end of our ascent, our launch to orbit. But in addition, during the first two minutes of flight, leaving, us, uh, leaving the launch pad with a very high acceleration to get us as quickly as possible through the lower regions of the atmosphere, we were pushed upwards by these big white solid propellant rockets. And we'll see all of that in action in just a second. Three launches to space, of course, as you have heard. Discovery twice. My first two flights were aboard Discovery. But my third flight was aboard Atlantis. And it was the second night launch of the space shuttle program, a unique experience in itself. But I've got a fourth picture up here because I want to say just something real quickly about NASA again and a contractor community to support with every launch. They do as much as is humanly possible to get ready not only to get, make things go as planned, but to take care of emergency situations. What if? What if something breaks? And there are millions of parts of these space shuttles as we're leaving the launch pad, and they better all be working right or we're not going to leave the ground. And so computers, watching everything in the countdown, the morning we tried to launch Discovery for the first time, the computer sent something that was not right with one of those liquid propellant rocket engines and shut everything off at T minus two seconds. <laughs> well, you've got to believe, as they say in the aviation business, there was a pretty high pucker factor in the cockpit at that point. We were really uh, 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 blessed with the, the uh, opportunity that NASA took to think about the, what the problems that might occur, as did occur, and program the computers to safely shut everything down if there should be a problem detected. And that's what happened that morning, even though you can see there was a good deal of, uh, of steam and smoke and some fire as the rocket engines had ignited for a couple of seconds. Uh, we got out of there safely. They did replace the rocket engines. And we went back into training to come back to the launch pad three months later for the first successful launch of Discovery. Well, let's see what it's like to go to space aboard the space shuttle. Countdown starts some four days before you lift off the launch pad. Crew members are, are, are people who are out here in the launch control center monitoring everything, checking until the last 
31 seconds when it really they're still there but the computers are very rapidly are checking everything at t minus 10 seconds spark sparkers clear hydrogen gas off the launch pad as the liquid fuel rocket engine started up and if the computers say good to go t zero and we have liftoff and there is a lot of rocket and roll inside the cockpit as we leave the launch pad with one and a half times the force of gravity and a lot of vibration 200 miles an hour when we're 200 feet off the launch pad and we're still uh, accelerating, of course, ever faster towards space. 10 seconds into flight, we roll over onto the correct azimuth or trajectory for the orbit which we went on that mission. Bye bye, Florida. Cameras on board the solid rocket boosters monitor the launch. Now, about 55 seconds into flight, we go through the speed of sound. Here's one camera looking up toward the nose of the orbiter and look at the shock wave as we pass through the speed of sound, not even a minute into flight. Now, the solid rocket boosters are burning uh, with over uh, three and a half, uh, four million pounds of thrust for uh, two minutes time, accelerating us to five times the speed of sound, which is only one fifth of the speed we need to be going, and we'll continue on the liquid fuel rockets, but those solid rockets burn out there are about 2 billion pounds of high explosive propellant. They're empty, they're dropped off after two minutes of flight. Here you see a camera on board the solid rocket watching the other solid rocket separated now from the orbiter and its external tank. They're falling 28 miles into the ocean that we recovered under parachutes, but here we go, we're still on our way to space. Here's another view of us being on our way. The orbiter attached to the, that big orange propellant tank three liquid fuel rocket engines firing for six more minutes to get us to space. This is what it was like inside the cockpit when those big solid rockets flash are explosively separated from the orbiter and our propellant tank. But it, the vibration suddenly stops and we feel a lot more comfortable, even though we're still rocketing towards space, comfortable enough to open our visors up for those last six minutes of ride to, you know, into orbit. Now, eight and a half minutes into flight, the rocket engines are being shut down at the base end of the orbiter, so there's a lot of vibration as they shut down, and ice is uh, sprayed out into space, even as the shuttle separates from its now empty tank. The tank falls into the atmosphere half a world away, uh, almost fast enough to go into orbit, but not quite, but it will vaporize in the atmosphere, probably over the Indian Ocean, even as the orbiter, with the last few pulses of a uh, little rocket propellant, was remaining to get itself into orbit. Here is the way the crew would experience the last uh, few seconds of flight. From three times the force of gravity pushing us back in our seats, we go to zero gravity as the rocket engine shut down. Now we check our procedures books and start shutting down uh, the launch systems because now we have to transform a rocket ship into a satellite. And so the uh, space shuttle, it is transformed. Uh, via ground command or mostly by crew operations into a operating space base uh, for a short period of time. In those early flights, we had those, our own operations going on out of the space shuttle. There was no space station to go to, yet the space station as a destination came along in the last few years of the shuttle program. So in those early flights, many flights were like my first flight. We took those paying customer satellites to space to leave them there. That's where they wanted to go to work. So here, each satellite was launched by the NASA crew members in our crew. Each satellite was launched out of the cargo compartment one at a time. Springs would push those satellites up and out into their own trajectory for a short period of time. And then rocket engines built into those satellites, like that spherical rocket engine at the base end of that communication satellite, would ignite and send the satellite into its much higher permanent orbit, maybe as high as 22,000 miles higher than we are here. Now that, that experiment that I told you about in the cargo compartment, the solar energy array experiment, it was called, SAE. The idea here was to develop a very large system on a, a flexible mylar plastic material that could be stored and compressed uh, into a storage container for launch. A system which, when unfurled in space, would, would uh, collect sunlight and bring that sunlight directly into electricity. A solar array experiment that successfully worked because that 17 and a half inch thick uh, compacted stack of plastic uh, material coated with photovoltaics expanded under our direction from inside the uh, crew compartment, expanded upwards, 
to 103 feet in height. This enormous mass of material out there in sunlight creating tens of thousands of watts of electricity directly from sunlight. Now, thinking ahead as that experiment did toward a future in which power systems and large structures would be needed in space, just like we're using today aboard the space station, another experiment was done on my third flight of space. NASA had an experiment for its astronauts in which there was a Lego or an erector set like kit of, of rods and uh, connectors out in the cargo compartment of the space shuttle. Now, the crew had to put on two crew members, Jerry Ross and Woody Spring on my flight, put on those big the white EVA suits, went outside, connected the piece parts together into this 25 foot long beam. Now, this beam, 25 feet in length and uh, weighing 250 pounds, well, weighing 250 pounds on Earth, it mass. 250 pounds up there. They could still, they had to try to maneuver that around, and they did successfully maneuver that around by hand, demonstrating that not only could large construction be done in the vacuum and the cold, uh, weightless space, but they could also maneuver it around even with bulky spacesuits. Now, I want to give you what I'm sure some of you already have in mind as you look at this, but just to make sure everybody's with us on this uh, trip through uh, low Earth orbit. Of course, Woody is up there on the end of a 60-foot-long robotic arm. That arm is attached to uh, the cargo bay of the space shuttle. Woody's out there 60 feet. That beam is 25 feet long. Those clouds, of course, those aren't above us. We're above the clouds. They're 110 miles below us. So this is, a, to me, this is an impressive picture because it doesn't, if it were in three dimensions, I think we'd all uh, have to hold on to the edges of our seat. Let me show you what uh, we went through on, uh, one of the things we went through on my second flight, when one of the satellites, which we took into space on that mission, one of the satellites did not work. It left the space shuttle, we sprung it out there, and there's supposed to be switches on the satellite, which click on as it leaves, turn the satellite on. The satellite didn't turn on. Ouch. We wanted to repair the satellite, so we put together some tools, some spare parts on board the, uh, in the crew compartment, and then two of our guys got a chance to go outside for the first unscheduled spacewalk in the shuttle program. Here you see with, uh, Jeff Hoffman and uh, Dave Briggs outside attaching the tools to the end uh, of the Canadian uh, arm, the robotic arm, in the cargo compartment of the space shuttle. And one day later, the commander and pilot of that mission flew the space shuttle up against the satellite. Well, the satellite is out there in its own orbit now. We had to rerun with the satellite. There's the end of the, of the arm with the tools on it. Now, just for scale again, the end of that arm and those tools are bigger than the podium that I'm standing next to. That satellite, if it were here with us, would occupy well, that whole half of the stage. And that satellite weighs 14,000 pounds, 7,000 pounds, which is high explosive rocket pounds. So this thing wasn't necessarily the safest maneuver, but we all wanted to get this very valuable, expensive satellite into operation. So we did successfully get that switch, it's just as big as a human finger, out here on the side of this rotating satellite. But this uh, still didn't work. Well, we were more than a little uh, depressed, and, uh, but the, the manufacturer radioed up to us, saying, don't be depressed about this. We're not. You guys were the only geek squad there, and nobody else could have done any troubleshooting on this satellite. But what you did, while it didn't directly work, it told us what the problem was. They said it's the electronics inside would fail, and they said they could build a black box. We left the satellite in orbit. We couldn't bring it up anyway. And the next shuttle flight went up, run through the satellite, connected the black box, turned it on. The satellite came to life, launched itself into higher orbit, went to work for 12 years, doing what it was supposed to do, and saved the country $70 million. Space is a unique place to look back on our beautiful human planet. Planet Earth is a marvelous, and as far as we know, even from all the telescopes and instruments we have in space looking outward, it's totally unique in this universe. It is certainly home to us, and when astronauts and cosmonauts come back after taking in eyefolds like this, one thing that every astronaut and cosmonaut that I've talked to agrees with is that we're all impressed, in fact humbled, by this thin blue line at the edge of the Earth. That thin blue line, which you can pinch between your fingers uh, as you look at it, uh, your fingers held at arm's length and your fingers only a centimeter apart, that thin blue line is our life support system. 
That's the environment of this planet Earth. That's the skin that keeps us alive. It's the air we breathe. It's the rain and the weather. It's both good and bad for us now and then. But ultimately, only for the good. And it's so thin, it's so delicate when you look at it from this perspective that I think that if an astronaut or cosmonaut was on the space and they weren't an environmentalist, they came home as fun. We've got to take a lot better care of the environment, which is so delicate when viewed in a, in a, uh, a stellar and uh, uh, spatial perspective. Let's see what it looks like from a video standpoint. Here we have a view over West Virginia. These are the Appalachian Mountains covered with snow in the wintertime, going over Virginia and toward the Atlantic Ocean. This then right at the Atlantic Ocean, the beaches, the white lines you see there, the rivers uh, leading into the uh, the Atlantic Ocean, clouds out over the Atlantic Ocean. Now that was the Earth in daytime. Here is the Earth at night. Here's one of you, as you would see it now, sped up about 10 times what the astronauts see. But this is what we see at nighttime. Now this is coming up over the United States, over the Gulf of Mexico. That was Houston, Texas, just went by here. New Orleans, those white dots there in the black Gulf of Mexico, those are oil rigs. Here's Tallahassee, there's Atlanta. They're coming up the, the East Coast. Yeah, the Appalachians, the Smokies are a little bit dark there, not too much in the way of city lights. The black areas here are the Great Lakes. There's uh, Washington, D.C., there's Baltimore, there's uh, Philadelphia, New York City and Long Island, Boston. We're coming up over Canada. Where are all the people in Canada? Well, they're probably right there in Montreal. <laughs> but what's that over the horizon? Well, first of all, the stars in the sky, the Milky Way, the, 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 the orange is the upper levels of the atmosphere illuminated by ultraviolet light from the sun, which is still over the horizon. But that green, the aurora, the aurora borealis here. Now we flip quickly the views. Now this is over the southern hemisphere, specifically over the, the Indian Ocean and Australia. Now look at this. The space shuttle and, and today the space station orbit through the very upper reaches of these uh, ephemeral... Uh, Auroras. The aurora australis here. Clouds dimly visible below, lit up by the aurora and probably by some moonlight. Stars in the sky and the sun is about to come up over the horizon. Glorious views of our home planet from space. This is what it's like to come home from space, aboard a space shuttle. Out the overhead windows, we de we started deorbiting. We're coming into the atmosphere 25 times the speed of sound in the air, cannot get out of the way fast enough. That was a superheated stream of gas, 300 miles long, following us in as we force our way back into the atmosphere. It's 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit outside for about 10 minutes, and that's creating that glow out the windows. It's like being inside of a neon tube when you're sitting in there in the cockpit. And we're nice and comfortable inside, though, even though we're in our emergency suits. Now, this is what we saw from the ground as a space shuttle would return here to the Cape, turning and banking in order to get rid of some of that energy that had kept us in orbit. We're turning here, banking, one of the final turns is over the beaches at, uh, at, in Florida here at the Cape, uh, Cape Canaveral and Cocoa Beach. Lining up for uh, approach to the runway. Here's the way the pilots and the commanders see the display out the window and reflected critical uh, characteristics of the flight, airspeed, altitude, orientation, and there's the runway highlighted. We want to get to that runway. They've got a, they're flying the shuttle now, but they're flying as a glider. There's no engine power. That runway is where we want to end up, but we're certainly going to end up down there somewhere. So the best of their piloting skills are putting to get this 100-ton glider to that runway. One of the most important jobs a pilot has is to get the wheels down, 500 feet off the ground. The wheels are down. We're coming up over the edge of the uh, runway. The commander's got the stick. The wheels come down and hit the runway at about 190 miles an hour. Then the pilot punches the parachute out the back end to slow us down even more as the nose wheels come down. A space shuttle has landed, the last space shuttle landed here at the Cape, of course, last July, not this July, but a year ago. The 135th mission in the space shuttle program was the last mission, even as the space shuttle completed its biggest, its original, and its final task, which was after dozens of flights, including the last one, had completed assembly and outfitting and uh, sending crew up and, and back from the International Space Station. 
Yes, the U.S. project, but only in part because we had major partners from 15 other countries around the world who have helped in designing, building, and operating and outfitting this international base in space. Now, that's a big thing. You saw pictures of it in the previous video. You saw astronauts not only building it, but flying through it. There's much volume inside the, uh, the research laboratories, the living areas, these modules, as much volume as there is inside the Boeing 747 jetliner. Now, most of that's taken up with science experiments, technical experiments, and also the food, water, air, to keep the astronauts alive and well. And there are six astronauts and cosmonauts there at all times. Not only operating this space in space, which, oh, by the way, is powered by these solar arrays. The, uh, this generation version of what we first flew on my first flight aboard Space Shuttle, the crew would work. They're now being used operationally to create, create 130,000 watts of electrical energy for the space in space. Using the, that energy to learn more about the physical processes of the world, of the universe, but in a different way. Looking at processes, science, technology differently in order to find out different things about them. And we'll use those different things, those discoveries, for our benefit right back here on Earth. As well as working toward NASA's big mission, which is the exploration of other worlds, and bringing that knowledge back to us. We're already sending rovers to Mars. We sent rovers to Mars, and as you all know, just a week and a half ago, the good rover uh, Curiosity, the Mars Science Lab, landed successfully on Mars and is within a day or two of starting its first uh, journeys across the surface of Mars. Our robot explorers are leading the way. We uh, will send astronauts to Mars with new big rockets that will be launched from the Cape here, just like the Oracle's robot explorers will launch from the Cape here over the next uh, many years. So the universe beckons, and we are out there exploring first with our robot explorers and then with we astronauts. Even as the space program changes from just a government program to government industry program, because private industry is also getting more involved Build, designing, testing, and we'll be building and leasing to NASA and other countries. Cargo ships built by private industry, just as FedEx takes uh, payloads around the world for you and me with a little charge. So these companies are going to take cargo to the space station and maybe even deeper into space eventually for a little charge, but not with your government dollars going into the big investment. And taxi security astronauts into space too in the future will probably be built and operated by private companies in a large part. Okay, well I'll take a breath now. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. But here is Stephen with a microphone and you, I hope, have some questions because we have a few minutes to answer your questions. We have about 10 minutes for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, Charlie, just raise your hand like this young lady right back here again. So I will bring you the microphone and you can ask him the first question. Make it really tough. How do you go poop in space? <laughs> <laughs> That's not only a hard question, but it's, uh, it's an important and natural question. <laughs> well, uh, my uh, favorite uh, media guy up in the booth will, I'm sure, find the appropriate picture to put on the screen here as I tell you in short form. The first thing I've got to say about that in answer is very careful. <laughs> Aboard Space Shuttle, there was a, a facility which we called the WCS. Now, for those of you with uh, British uh, Isle, UK uh, uh, cultural experience, we're not talking about a, a water closet, we're talking about a waste collection system. But it does the same thing. And as you can see, everybody out here is familiar with this, uh, this uh, question, I'm sure. Uh, if anybody's not familiar with that question, if you look at your neighbor and it's like, oh my, what are we talking about here? They're probably an alien, right? Because <laughs> we're all familiar with what goes on in a facility that's got a seat like that. Now, that's where you sit. Except remember, this is in weightlessness. You don't sit. You can't sit. That's why. So that's why there are these thigh bars here, which when you get down close to sitting, you put those thigh bars over your thighs and hold you down. You put your feet in these stirrups to hold your feet in place. And there are even some more straps here that you can strap over your legs to make sure that you stay where you should. So 
So here's where you take care of the solid waste and the uh, bullet waste. She didn't ask about that part. The liquid waste is taken care of from uh, through that vacuum, that tube right there. Now, because here on Earth, as everybody again, everybody that's in the aliens out there, uh, everybody's familiar that gravity is important to the process here on Earth. I see everybody on Earth, yes. <laughs> Except there's no gravity here, which leads to the biggest question of all. So how do you take care of that? Ah, uh, airflow. So you make sure that there's air flow down past you. Yes, a mile of suction to pull things away from you. Just like gravity pulls things away from you here on Earth. Now, how do we get that? Well, there's a three-step procedure. And you've got to get these steps in the right order, okay? So you're in here, you're, taking, you're, you're, you're ready to take care of business now. So the first step is seated, like I just told you. The second step is that you get this switch down here. There's a rotary switch that you turn to turn on the fans. No, it's not for that reason, although it helps for that reason. <laughs> these, are, these are bands that give you that airflow down past you, okay? That's the second step. The third step, make sure it's the third step, is to push this lever down. That opens up the valve that's closed off that hole to this point. So you're sitting there, and now that valve is open. Okay, everybody kind of... Take care of uh, business, okay? Everybody feel better now? you, you got to get out of there now. So three steps to get out, and you better get these steps in the right order, okay? <laughs> first thing you want to do, the first thing you want to do is to close that valve. Then you turn off the fan. Then you leave. Now, you better get this in the right order, otherwise something might fall you out of here, okay? <laughs> so that's how you take care of it. The other question is this hard. Were you nervous the first time you um, went on in the rocket? Um, I wouldn't necessarily characterize it, call it nervousness. It's more like being afraid. <laughs> <laughs> it was more like being a little scared, a little scared. Nervous, certainly, but maybe the high end of nervous, okay? You can't sit on, I mean, there can't be a thinking person that goes out there and sits on top of a rocket with four million pounds of high explosive underneath of you, knowing that except for those crew members who have all signed up for the same job or are sitting there strapped in the seats with you. Everybody else is at least three and a half miles away. Why are they so far away? Because they don't want to be around four million pounds of high explosive just in case something doesn't go right. So, yeah, you're nervous. It's more than that. Because that's just an eight minute ride on top of rockets in space. Then you've got days, maybe weeks in space. So you've got lots of work to do out there. So I was nervous also that my, my work might not go as I expected. Things might break that I couldn't fix. I might not be able to get my job done. I might mess up and not get my job done right. So I was nervous about the whole big deal. This was a big deal, as well as dangerous. So yeah, I was nervous for, and more than nervous for, uh, for uh, several different reasons. How much oxygen is there to keep an oxygen to keep an astronaut comfortable in the shuttle? Well, there is in the space shuttle. We have the atmosphere uh, as essentially like you're breathing now. There's oxygen, maybe about oh about 18 percent, 20 percent oxygen around us right now. 80, about 79, 78 percent nitrogen, and then there's a little argon, a little few other things, some carbon dioxide in the air around us. Uh, but in the space shuttle, the atmosphere is just a little simpler. It's 20% oxygen and 80% nitrogen. It's a mix, very close to what we have here, and it's the same pressure as we have <coughs> around us now. So it's a comfortable atmosphere, just like we're breathing now. This guy over next to you has the next question. When is your next launch? When is my next launch? My next launch, well, let's see, I think I've got to uh, rely upon one of those one of those private industry companies, one of those commercial companies, because I'm through flying with NASA, my medical research, well, because do we get that next transportation system? And I don't know when that's coming along, but it'll take that uh, medical purification equipment into space much more frequently than we could have ever aboard a shuttle and much less expensively. Until that happens, I can never go back to that. So I think my next job, maybe as a tour guide, when very rich billionaires and millionaires want to go into space and see all those great sites. I think that's my next job, but I'm not sure when that's going to happen. Two more questions. Sorry about this gentleman. What are the qualifications for becoming an astronaut? Oh, qualifications to become an astronaut. Well, first of all, let me say very clearly that uh, uh, 
Uh, while I will be the first to tell you that an astronaut's job is not only hard work, but it is maybe the best job around in terms of the rewards that you get from it. Because the only places where a few of the people have a chance to go, it's a glorious job, but there aren't very many positions out there for the astronauts. You, it, it's probably more likely, statistically, in terms of numbers, that you could become the world's soccer champion or uh, a, a, a basketball star than to become an astronaut. There are just more positions on soccer teams, football teams, around the world, basketball teams, than there are astronaut jobs. So that's just the reality. But if you really, really, really want to work toward the possibility, you've got to stay in school, learn as much as you can, focus on science and engineering, and maybe medicine too, uh, mathematics, you need to learn multiple languages. There aren't individual astronauts going into space speaking any one language, Russian, English, anymore. There are crews, teams of astronauts who go to space now and will in the future. And they'll be international. So we'll need to know different languages just to be able to communicate with each other. And you need to have discipline. So team sports is a good thing just because you need to work as a team. And you got to know how to do that before you get in that rocket to go wherever you're going. So those are maybe the most important things, but even more important than that, whatever you want to do in life, set a goal. Look, think about what you'd like to do with your life in the future to help your family, yourself, your community. Set those goals big, dream big, go after those and however you can, and I think education is good for anything you want to do, go after those goals and never, never, ever give up. Okay. And this young lady has the privilege of the last question. Do you feel like upside down when you are upside down? Well, that's a great question because as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, the sensation of being upside down here on Earth is largely due, not entirely, but largely due to the fact that when you turn upside down, blood rushes to your head. Just like right now, blood is rushing to your feet, but your feet are so dumb they don't rush like that. Because your head's very smart, so get what you know when you're upside down, but your head starts getting full. But hey, that's the cause of gravity. So in space, there's no gravity. So when you turn upside down, you don't feel that way. Now the other thing is, when you turn upside down, your eyes, of course, tell you that everything looks different. So your eyes are telling your brain to turn upside down too. In space, of course, your eyes are still working like they do down here, and your eyes say, whoops, everything looks different. But your brain says, I know, but I don't feel bad. There's no, uh, there's no blood rush in my head, so get over it. So <laughs> your brain kind of tells the rest of you, hey, yeah, you're upside down, but it doesn't feel bad. Deal with it. It's just normal now. So in a few hours' time, once an astronaut gets into space, within a very few hours, your brain starts reprogramming itself and says, hey, it's fun every which way. Sideways, upside down. So it doesn't really matter once you get into space. You get used to it within a few hours of time, and then it's just fun. It's wonderful. It's awesome. It's freedom. Being superwoman, superman, flying through the cabin of the spaceship, the space shuttle, the space station. The freedom of not being stuck to the floor is a marvelous thing. Well, I want to tell you, I think it's a marvelous thing that you have chosen to come here to Kennedy Space Center today. Thank you for doing that. Have a great day. And